Good evening. Welcome to the Kalamazoo City Commission meeting, uh, the committee of the whole meeting of Monday, October 4th, 2021. This afternoon's meeting is being streamed live on our YouTube channel. And as of right now, we're informed that the Facebook channel is down, but folks can still catch that live recorded on this live on our YouTube channel and also recorded uh, in the future if you wanna go back to that. You can also listen to tonight's meeting by calling area code 269-552-6425 and entering meeting ID number 828 2503355 when prompted. And you may call and leave a public comment for tonight's committee of the whole meeting by calling area code 269 226 6573. And we'll turn the meeting and get it over, get it started with Mayor David Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Deputy City Manager Chamberlain. I appreciate it. It's wonderful to see everybody tonight. I know we've got some uh, uh, great topics to discuss at this Committee of the Hall meeting, and I look forward to uh, not only those presentations, but uh, be able to be accessed by anyone in our community now or later. So at this point, I'm calling to order our Committee of the Hall meeting for October 4th, Monday, our five o'clock meeting. And Scott Borling, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Cunningham. Here in the great city of Kalamazoo. Commissioner Hess. Here in Kalamazoo. Commissioner Knott. Here at Kalamazoo. Commissioner Pradle. Present in the city of Kalamazoo. Commissioner Urban. Vice Mayor Griffin. Here in Kalamazoo. Mayor Anderson. Here in the city of Kalamazoo. And may we please have a motion to excuse Commissioner Urban. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Cunningham. Second. Supported by Commissioner Hess. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Thank you. Uh, Deputy City Manager Chamberlain, are there any communications? None tonight, sir. Thank you. And now is our opportunity for public comments here during our Committee of the Whole meeting. Do we have any public comments, DCM Chamberlain? Yes, we do, and we'll go ahead with those right now. Thank you. My name is Alfonso Harris. I'm a Kalamazoo resident living in the 900 block of North Burdick Street. Um, it's been made known to me that residents are not allowed to sleep over two hours in the city parks. Um, I think that that is anti-homeless and that that should not be. Uh, it should not be against the law to sleep. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and commissioners, that was the only public comment received for tonight. Thank you, DCM Chamberlain. Uh, so next is our review of items for upcoming city commission agendas, DCM Chamberlain. Sure, thank you, sir. So we do have your business meeting at seven o'clock for the city commission. Uh, it's a relatively short agenda tonight with uh, about four items on your consent agenda. One of which though, uh, just it, it is on the consent agenda, but uh, it's about approximately $9.5 million approval for the construction of the new fire station in the Edison neighborhood. And so uh, we can give information then, uh, but also just pointing out that uh, we've worked with our architects to find a way to make it LEED certified. And so uh, we are bringing that forward for consideration tonight. Um, we do have a closed session tonight. And then for your meeting next week, October 18th, which is the, uh, the last official business meeting of this commission. And uh, it, it is filling up quite rapidly for that evening. Uh, we do have a number of consent agenda items. Uh, and then we do have some other major topics at night. Uh, at your committee of the whole, we will have a presentation regarding um, the internal assessment that we've done for the diversity, equity, and inclusion survey. Uh, so we'll be having a presentation on that. And we're also working on a few other presentations. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Griffin. And then uh, during the evening, we do have an item of old business that is coming back that night uh, regarding the graphic packaging um, tax abatement request. And so that is coming back for consideration that evening also. So uh, that is all. Uh, thank you, DCM Chamberlain. Uh, so I know we have a couple good topics here on our work session and uh, I will let you uh, go ahead and introduce our participants. Right. Well, thank you very much. Well, 
tonight. Uh, our first presentation tonight is regarding the uh, Kalamazoo Energy Collaborative. That's a, a partnership with Consumers Energy. And uh, Jamie McCarthy from our Community Planning and Economic Development Department is here tonight. Uh, she's our Sustainability Coordinator. Uh, she, there's some folks that are working on that from uh, consumers end of, the, of it also. And then we also have Director James Baker just to kind of tie that in with another energy efficiency program that we're working cons with consumers on. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jamie and, and her team. Thank you, Deputy City Manager, and good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners, and thanks for having us here to give you an update on this program that we launched earlier this year with Consumers Energy. I'm going to share my screen here, just a moment. That should be popping up and you'll see slides there for the Kalamazoo Energy Collaborative. We're just gonna be brief tonight, but to give you a little bit of background, this is a program that in March of this year, the city signed an MOU with Consumers Energy to launch a sort of first of its kind energy benchmarking program which is led by um, a power utility and partnering with um, a community like Kalamazoo here in Southwest Michigan. And the program on part of consumers is really tied to their energy waste reduction strategy and is part of their plan to reach um, uh, net zero emissions by 2040 and phase out all of their coal, which they've committed to do by 2025. And so part of that requires uh, more energy efficiency uh, more energy savings from all of its customers. From Kalamazoo's perspective, the partnership allows us to work more closely with buildings that have large energy footprints in the city, and we can help them to improve their building performance and become more efficient over time. And the program aligns really well with the city's uh, strategic vision for environmental responsibility, striving for a green and healthy city, and then ultimately some of our um, future sustainability goals, really encouraging investing in our investments in our existing building stock and trying to reduce our energy usage as a community. And then just as a side note, I'll mention staff will be at community uh, committee of the whole meeting in a couple of weeks to preview a draft sustainability plan and sort of roll out our public engagement um, that will happen over the next couple of months before bringing back a plan for your approval at the end of the year. So you can keep that uh, in the back of your mind. This is tied to uh, that kind of work. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about the program here and um, what we're planning to do over the next quarter and over the next year. So this is a voluntary energy benchmarking program um, for our existing commercial and multifamily buildings in Kalamazoo. And it, we're calling it the Kalamazoo Energy Collaborative. It's a program that provides free resources, technical assistance, and a recognition component for energy efficiency achievements that these buildings strive toward and accomplish. Um, a good comparison, well, I'll just mention here, the uh, participants who are eligible, uh, the types of buildings that we're looking for, uh, we're really targeting buildings of 20,000 square feet or greater, but you know, any large commercial building will be um, able to participate in the program. So we're talking about large private commercial buildings, large public buildings, and uh, buildings from the multi-family sector. Uh, the program doesn't work as well with industrial, so we're excluding industrial, uh, you know, manufacturing, processing type facilities, and the single family residential uh, buildings. And um, Director Baker will be able to talk a little bit more about how the city has partnered with consumers to um, help those sorts of residential customers. So um, the program really, a uh, comparison we're making often is that um, it's sort of compared to nutrition labels that we use in our everyday lives or the energy guide labels if we're buying a new appliance. And it's really creating a standardized energy intensity score for a building. And then uh, buildings can know their score and improve their score over time. They also can compare that score to other buildings. Um, the... What we're going to be doing this fall is um, a pilot uh, small group project where we're going to be testing some new online tools that are being developed. So they're going to be able to integrate consumers energy account data, information that consumers already has for you as an account holder, and then placing that into an energy portal that will help you make some of these um, calculations and start comparing with other buildings. The full rollout of the, plan, the program is planned for spring of 2022. 
So after we sort of test with this smaller group, we'll plan to bring that out to the uh, community in the spring. We're targeting uh, around 30 buildings that we'd love to have participate in this uh, process starting in the spring. And we'll start that uh, outreach probably just after the first of the year. We've been working with city staff and IT to help get us that you know, list of that inventory of buildings and we'll reach out to them directly. But right now we're looking for folks, uh, building managers and owners in the community who might be interested in this um, first pilot phase, the small group who may wanna participate and run their buildings and their energy information through the program. So for those who are interested, I wanted to introduce uh, Brittany Cullimore, she's uh, a consultant with Consumers Energy, and I'll let her introduce herself and talk about her role and how to get connected. Thank you, Jamie, uh, and thank you everyone for having us here today to talk about our uh, pilot. My name is Brittany Cullimore. I am the program coordinator for Consumers Energy's local government benchmarking pilot of which the Kalamazoo Energy Collaborative is our uh, first iteration. Uh, so Kalamazoo is the first community that we're, we are working with on this uh, program. And uh, we're very excited to be working with the city uh, as we kind of move forward with uh, launching and implementing this program in the city and hopefully growing it. Um, and uh, as Jamie mentioned, we are currently um, in, uh, pre-launch phase where we um, have a new digital tool we've been working to develop um, that can help facilitate the benchmarking process for buildings. Um, benchmarking often can be, uh, it's kind of the first step to uh, taking energy efficiency measures in a building, but it uh, can be a bit of a lift, um, especially the first time it's done. And this platform we're working on um, will have the capability to sort of automate that process. So we're really excited to be able to offer that to um, customers in Kalamazoo. And so currently we are looking for a small group of early participants to join us this fall. Uh, so starting um, later next or later this month, um, where we'll uh, kind of onboard them onto that portal and uh, do kind of a testing phase with the platform uh, before we roll this out citywide. Um, so if there are any, uh, anyone listening uh, now who may be interested in um, signing up their building for the program as an early participant, uh, I have my contact information here and also our pilot lead, Mike Daisy, um, Either of us, you can reach out to us if you're interested in learning more, um, if you're interested in hearing updates on the program uh, or signing up as an early participant. Um, so that's, that's all I have to share today, uh, but I welcome any questions and I look forward to uh, staying in touch as we move forward with launching this program. Thank you. So just as far as the format here, do you wanna continue with more presentation? Do you want to have some opportunity for questions now? What would be best for what you're intending to do? So J Jamie or? Yeah, I will, we'd be happy to entertain any questions now if you have those on the commercial program. I do want to make sure we have time for Director Baker to give us an update on the residential side. Okay, as well. let's go ahead and do that next then. Director Baker, you wanna give a little update on the, the residential program that the city's also working on? Sure, thank you, uh, Deputy City Manager. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Mayor City Commission um, for giving me this opportunity to talk about our program. I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen real quick here. And you should uh, be able to see a water conservation document that's up. Um, so the uh, City of Kalamazoo uh, Department of Public Services partnering with Consumers Energy launched um, back in May of this year, a uh, program that we're calling the Helping Neighbors Program. Uh, this is a program that seeks to improve efficiency of customers' uh, usage of water and gas within their home. Um, and we uh, get after this efficiency through um, updating fixtures, um, looking for water leaks, and in piping, things of that nature. Uh, also looking at older water heaters, older inefficient furnaces, um, and also uh, leaking toilets are also a big um, component of 
higher usage rates within residential water customers. Um, talk about program participation. Now we have approximately 3,899, so just under 4,000 program participants at, to date. And we still are accepting program participants, uh, folks that are interested to uh, reduce their energy usage within their homes or increase their efficiency can give us a call at the city at 311. Uh, this program is also eligible to folks, uh, customer communities, um, such as townships and the communities that we serve both for water and wastewater. Uh, so folks that are living outside the city can give us a call at 337-8000 and we can sign you up for this program. So talking a little bit about uh, the, the program, once you sign up, um, there's kind of two classes that you fall into. If you've had a energy audit, home audit done by Consumers Energy within the last five years, uh, you would qualify to receive the products that are focused just on water. Uh, and with that, uh, we really focus a lot on that uh, potential toilet leaks. And if your home has not participated within the last five years, you're eligible to get a complete home audit where representatives from Consumers Energy will actually come into your home um, and look through everything to include that furnace, water heater, uh, pipes of, uh, of that nature. And again, we've got 257 families to date that uh, have either completed that audit or have scheduled that audit. Um, talking a little bit about the toilet leak, uh, a lot of times when we say that, uh, intuitively, that sounds like something we all should know about, like there'd be water flowing over the floor in your bathroom. However, that's not the case. Oftentimes, toilet leaks you have to test for. Um, we give a dye packet in the kit, that dye packet you put in the back of the tank, and then uh, if there's dye visible, then there is a leak. And uh, toilets that uh, leak, that can be a, a driver of, of your water bill that can really increase your water bill. Uh, and that's something that's that's not intentional use of water. It's not like you're watering your lawn or something. Um, this is also an opportunity for us to communicate with our customer base. And uh, in doing so, we have a couple items that we've sent out uh, to talk about water quality uh, and things of that nature. We also talk a little bit about lead. Um, and this is also an opportunity for us to plug our, our lead program where uh, any home within our uh, program can get um, free lead testing. And we also offer free NSF certified filters to, to any customer within our water system. Um, so that concludes my presentation. And at this time, I'll go ahead and stop sharing and turn that back over um, uh, to you folks. Thank you, Director Baker. Uh, any commissioners that have questions for any of our presenters here? Uh, Commissioner Urban. Yes, I wanted to know if there are uh, apartment uh, buildings that are uh, on the pilot list of pilot uh, uh, participants in the program that Brittany is running. Or is that considered residential and who handles uh, large apartments? Yeah, thank uh, you, Commissioner Urban. I can answer that one. And Brittany, you can fill in as well. Uh, we do have, we have identified on our list through the city and our inventory of uh, buildings, quite a few multifamily residential. So yes, um, anything, Brittany, you'll have to remember, remind me on the count, but we're looking for, you know, multiple units, apartment complexes, um, a lot of our student housing, things of that nature would all um, fit into that category. Thank you. Yes, uh, just to add to that, just to give you an idea, um, we are targeting buildings uh, 20,000 square feet and larger. So uh, a 20,000 square foot multifamily building, you could uh, consider that would be 15 to 20 units. Um, so on the, the larger side of multifamily buildings. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners? Yeah, Commissioner Pradle. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, this is uh, Chris Pradle. I was just curious um, if you have any information, if, if this is uh, somewhat unique to the city of Kalamazoo, or is this, um, you know, being piloted or worked on in other communities in the state? And then I was just kind of curious as well, uh, you know, where you envision this going, you know, like what uh, trajectory of growth or, um, you know, where, where's the kind of um, North Star of where you want to get uh, with this pilot program? So that might be a question for primarily uh, Jamie and Brittany. Brittany, do you want to talk about places that CE has worked with across, I guess, the region? And I'm not as familiar with state programs. Yeah, sure. So uh, 
This is the first, uh, this program is the first of its kind um, it, in the nation that we know of where we're directly partnering with the utility and the city um, on a program like this. There are a number of uh, voluntary benchmarking programs in other cities across the country, um, but this uh, typically the utility uh, kind of goes in one direction and the city goes in another direction with these types of uh, benchmarking programs. So uh, this is the first time that we're kind of bringing both entities together to combine resources to launch a program like this. Um, we do hope that we can take this to other uh, similar communities in Michigan, um, but Kalamazoo is the first city in the state that we're working with on this pilot. So. Um, this is a pilot program, so it's something that we're testing out. We hope it will be successful and we can uh, use success in Kalamazoo as a model um, you know, for future programs in the state. Commissioner Hess, I saw you had a question. I did, just a, a short question. When, um, I know you said you were gonna reach out to them later this month. Uh, when could you come back to us and let us know who is going to actually be participating? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I, I think we hope to have a group of five to six buildings uh, signed up by the end of this month. Uh, we hope to have the platform ready to uh, stand up for customers to onboard um, and start testing out in the month of November. Uh, so we could probably have an update on who is in our early participant group uh, in the month of November. Other questions, commissioners? I don't see one at this point. So, you know, I am always very fired to hear uh, something like we're the first. So uh, that that is a very, very exciting position to be in on this. It, it sounds like a, a great program and a great idea. So my question for you is, how can we as the commission uh, help this be successful? What do you need from us on the, on the public side of things? Sure, thank you, Mayor Anderson, for that question. Um, really what we're, what we're looking for is uh, public support of city leadership for this program and for energy efficiency. Um, and you know, we see the work that's being done in Kalamazoo to uh, put up a sustainability strategy and climate action goals and programs like this uh, can really work to support those goals. And so uh, just encouraging local organizations and businesses to participate in these programs um, and recognizing the work that, that they're doing when, when they are participating and taking action. Um, I think that's the, the best way that city leadership can help um, in, in uh, encouraging participation. I was going to add to, I think uh, once we have a larger group participate this spring, we'd love to be able to, in a very public way, recognize the accomplishments of those buildings, looking at their Energy Star um, scores and certifications and being able to really elevate them and their work and point them um, out as good examples and good partners with the city. So Ms. McCarthy, are you doing a kind of direct recruitment at this point? Uh, or is yes. this going to be generally broadcast and, and hope you find some volunteers? We will take both approaches. So we certainly have a list of and have been engaging with folks who we feel like are really leaders in this area, uh, who have commercial buildings in the city. Um, we've been able to connect with some churches and some other partners who maybe haven't taken advantage of consumers programs. And so they're excited to participate. Uh, we certainly will do direct outreach after the first small pilot group is done to that list of it's around 120 or so buildings in the city that meets the 20,000 square foot threshold. Okay. So we'll do some of that direct work, but certainly if folks who have a building that's 12,000 square feet or 9,000 square feet and they meet certain criteria, they're going to be welcome to participate. Fantastic. Sounds great. I really look forward to that. Anything else uh, for this presentation? I'm sorry, Commissioner Urban. Well, I'm thinking about the residential uh, part. Uh, it's really kind of uh, sh shocking to me to uh, realize how high uh, uh, heating bills are uh, 
uh, in, uh, in some parts of Kalamazoo, in, uh, in older homes. Uh, and if we're simply asking them to lower their, their, their thermostats, uh, I don't know how far we'll get with that. Uh, so I'm hoping that your program is going to include some, uh, some uh, case examples of people who had invested in insulation or invested in uh, a newer refrigerator or something to actually be able to show like before and after uh, with real examples. Uh, is, are you considering that as part of your program? Yes, uh, Commissioner Irvin, thank you for the comments. Um, you know, as, as we look to conclude the, the program, and I, and I mentioned there's 257 home audits. So that's really, I wanted to talk about um, of the participants, which participants would we expect to see some, some real advantage uh, of work getting done. And that would be those participants that actually had the home audits. And those home audits will point out things like insulation, appliance efficiencies, things of that nature. Um, applicants who are income qualified um, can also uh, potentially receive um, support for, for that work. So that isn't always on the homeowner if there, if there is an income qualification there. Um, that being said, uh, we don't have uh, at this point uh, a way to document some of those before or after uh, within within the city, but we're certainly interested uh, to take a, to look at that and uh, to to ask our partners at Consumers uh, to see if we can bring some of those stories back. So that's uh, uh, you know certainly a, a re recommendation that's 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 heard, and we we can take that forward. Thank you. So I would like to. Uh, Thank Ms. McCarthy and uh, the team from Consumers, I guess. I, I saw that there's a Stephanie here. I'm not sure if, if uh, she's from Consumers as well, but thank you for being interested in this work and thank you for the partnership. I, I really look forward to, uh, to great things out of this and really building on it. So thanks for bringing us uh, this information tonight. Deputy City Manager Chamberlain. Uh that concludes that presentation. And again, like you said, Mayor, we want to thank consumers for, for partnering with us on this. Um, it really impacts not only our residents, but also um, large property owners and businesses here in town. And, and so all together uh, is really what we have to do to make a difference on it. Uh, so our next presentation tonight um, is related to the Native American Mound in Bronson Park. Um, and uh, specifically ground penetrating radar report. And uh, I'd like to introduce two other guests that we have here tonight that they're welcome to join us, uh, Dr. David Bros and uh, Councilwoman uh, Phyllis Davis uh, from the Machi Benashiwish Band of Potawatomi Indians, um, the Gun Lake Tribe. And what we wanna do tonight is uh, talk a little bit about some pretty exciting uh, things that are happening um, with Bronson Park and also this idea of giving the community and the city commission here tonight an update on this ground penetrating radar scan. So just to do a, a little bit of a, a background information, um, if you remember uh, early 2018, uh, the Fountain of the Pioneers uh, that was removed from Bronson Park um, and as part of that, a lot of questions were raised about uh, the Native American mound in Bronson Park. You know, everybody knows that the mound there and the kind of the southwest quadrant of the park is there. Uh, and there were there were a lot of comments and questions raised about the history of that mound. And so, as part of the Bronson Park plan, we we had a committee that worked on education, and that committee was looking at doing education about the his history of Bronson Park. But as we did the um, improvements to Bronson Park, that committee has grown to look more at the specific history of the Native American tribes that have been here in the Kalamazoo area and, and their history and how, how can that history be told correctly. Uh, so that's where that group has been working on uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, very happy to have uh, members of the Gun Lake Tribal Council and staff as members of that committee. Uh, Dr. David Brose, uh, who's an archeologist has been on that committee. Uh, Kalamazoo Valley Museum, uh, Kalamazoo uh, Arts Council and other representatives working with us on that. And so 
I would like to now kind of turn it over to uh, Councilwoman Phyllis Davis uh, from, from the Gun Lake Tribe just to say a few words. And then after that, we'll have Dr. Bros uh, start to give us some information about the findings of the report. Uh, Councilwoman Davis, welcome. Oh, who's you? Asiokwe and Dishnikas, Potawatomi and Dow, Matchipanashiwish and Dabandagwas, Grand Valley and Dochibia, Bradley, Michigan, and Dion and Mishike and Dotum. So my name is Phyllis Davis and I'm, I greeted you in my language. Um, I'm Potawatomi. I'm from the Matchipanashiwish band of Potawatomi Indians, also known as the Gun Lake Tribe. I'm, uh, I live in Grand Valley. I call it Grand Valley. A lot of people call it Standale, Allen. Anyway, I'm out in the country that way, but I'm originally from Bradley area and uh, my clan is Turtle. So I just wanted to say greetings to all of you and um, miigwech on behalf of my council, my chairman, Bob Peters and my council members. Um, thank you for giving us this time to go through this report. And, um, you know, as um, Mr. Chamberlain had mentioned, um, these things happened uh, over a year ago and my tribal government um, has certainly been impacted by uh, the pandemic and our work um, life has been impacted as well. A lot of it has slowed down to a slow crawl. Um, we do work remotely now. Um, so, so we're trying very hard to assist and stay on track with meetings that we've been involved in so we can move things forward. So I'm really looking forward to um, you all listening to the uh, summary of the report. I, I found it really interesting and I think we've got some really exciting ways that we can move forward. So once again, miigwech. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Dr. Bros, uh, we, we have a, a slideshow that we'd like to uh, give some basic information. Um, and, and Dr. David Bros, uh, let you go ahead and introduce yourself and then we'll start the slide presentations. Um, my name is David Bros. I've uh, got a degree in archaeology and anthropology from the University of Michigan quite a while ago. Uh, I've done a lot of field archaeology. I've been a museum director in science museums. And uh, now here I'm a, I'm a member of, I was a member for many years of the Historic Preservation Commission. And now uh, with John Shelvinabi, I co chair the Kalamazoo Public Education Committee uh, to talk about the mounds and the reservation. So uh, we did that work about a year and a half ago, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to present it to the council uh, and to the members of the city administration. Let me go ahead and start sharing that. Okay. Um, so this is, a, as it says, it's a summary of the archeological interpretations. There is a formal report it's been turned into the uh, Parks Department and to the city uh, engineers because uh, we wanted to make sure that the rerouting of sprinklers and water lines and gas lines as the park was developed uh, would avoid any potential archaeologically interesting material. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, to be to be brief when the first europeans came to this area that was the french they got here in the mid 17th century and they ran into a group of people called the nation of fire uh, the anishinaabeg the confederacy of the adawa and the ojibwa and the badwatomi who had been here at that point for many many thousands of years uh, the europeans were pretty much aggressive and the uh the first the French met with the Native Americans, then the British took over that part of the country, and finally, uh, after the revolution, the Americans took over this part of the country. Uh, and in all of those cases, what they wanted was land. And so treaty after treaty ended up uh, reducing the amount of land that that Native group, uh, Anishinaabeg Confederacy, uh, was able to control. This is a map of present day Michigan. Uh, and you can see the various land secessions. Uh, the dark green one down, or sorry, the yellow one down in the lower southeast, uh, that was the Treaty of Detroit. After having given up all of the land to the Miami and Wabash Rivers in 1795 and 1805, uh, that part of Michigan was seceded 
uh, back to the federal government. And then that kind of a pinky wedge that angles down so that its southwestern point is right there at Kalamazoo. Uh, that, that was the Treaty of 1821. And right at that point of Kalamazoo, a nine square mile block was reserved for the uh, Mashabinashuish Potawatomi Band. Next picture. Uh, this is a picture of Kalamazoo Township, and you can see within the middle of it a nine square mile block labeled the Machibinashuish Reservation. Down in the lower right corner, you'll see Woods Lake. You can see the uh, Kalamazoo River tinkling through on the upper right corner. Uh, that land was given back to the Native community in 1821. The rest of the land was platted out to be sold. You can see the uh, designations on the right, those are the surveyor's notes about how much land was unpalatable, un unarable, <clears throat> because that would depend on the costs for those lands as the land office began to sell them off. Next picture, please. Next picture, that shows that nine square mile block. You can see the uh, Portage Creek coming in from the lower right, uh, Arcadia Creek uh, moving in, and uh, Axdale Creek uh, swinging in from the left. And those flowing into the Kalamazoo River. Uh, by the way, my house is in that upper right uh, section. <clears throat> Each of those blocks is one square mile. There you can see the land within that area being divided up for sale. In 1827, the territorial governor, Louis Cass, decided that this block of land lay a little too close to the road between Detroit and Chicago, and so it was taken away from the Indians and put up for sale. Next picture. <clears throat> That's that same nine square mile block showing you what it looks like in terms of where Kalamazoo is today. So you can see we are definitely living on Potawatomi land. Next picture. Next. What the city has done is to go out and mark with about 45 different street signs the boundaries of that 1821-1827 Potawatomi reservation. This is the one in the southwestern corner. <coughs> It's where Wellington Road uh, meets Parkview. <clears throat> You'll find those other corners, and if you want to, you can take a little uh, jog. It would be about a half a marathon to walk that reservation line all the way around each side of that nine square mile block. Thank you. Next. Uh, when the Native communities moved up here, they were mostly hunting and gathering many thousands of years ago. Uh, but the people who came in the 19th century were very interested in what they ran into. They ran into a whole series of raised ridged fields. Now, the ridged fields were present in Indiana, in, in Illinois, in southern Wisconsin, and across southern Michigan. But some of the most interesting raised fields were the ones found in Kalamazoo County. And in Kalamazoo County, those ancient raised garden beds took on geometric shapes. The raised fields were important because agriculture was just coming in. Maize agriculture was being introduced by the native communities to this area probably about 800, 900,000 years ago. And during that time period, it was a little warm climate episode called the Neo-Atlantic before the Little Ice Age came in about the 1200, a little period of warmer and moister air. But the corn is always very sensitive to having its feet get wet, as the farmers say, and a low-lying frost in the early days of the spring can really kill the crop. These raised fields raised the corn plants above the level of those early frosts. Pretty good agriculture. In Kalamazoo, those took on a geometric shape, probably for ceremonial reasons. And that wheel shown down in the lower right is one that was first encountered, I'm sorry, lower left. I'm left-handed, so we have that problem. The first encountered somewhere to the south of the mound that is now sitting in Bronson Park. Next. Uh, when Bronson Park was developed, uh, it was part of a four square mile block that was platted out as four squares that were given to the community. Uh, given to the community, uh, one was for the jail, one was for an academy run by the University of Michigan. Go blue. One was the county courthouse, and one was a square reserved for the church. They were divided by Church Street running north and south, and by uh, Academy Street running east and west. 
Uh, later, the jail was moved from where it sat on the uh, on the southwest quadrant and moved up to the uh, <clears throat> to the courthouse square. Uh, and the two lower squares were joined together to make what is now Bronson Park. Uh, the mound sat in the southwestern quadrant. <coughs> excuse me, of of that southwestern quadrant, which is marked here the jail. Next slide. Uh, the mound always intrigued people. Uh, the first evidence we have of people digging into it to see what it might have took place in 1832. And uh, uh, two people uh, from Schoolcraft Township, a judge, came up and dug into it. They dug down about as far as the level of the ground around it. Uh, they were there for the day. They got tired, said didn't find much. Uh, kind of a disappointment. I think they were looking to find, well, in 1832, nobody knew uh, whether or not this mound had been built by Vikings or Phoenicians or people called mound builders. Excuse me. The dig in the middle of the mound was left open, and the jail decided to use that for a root cellar. So from 1832 to 1847, when the jail moved, and this was the hole in the middle was cribbed over with logs and it was used to store potatoes and turnips and whatever else they could feed uh, to the prisoners in the jail. <coughs> when the jail moved, a, uh, a gentleman named Sheldon, who ran the local newspaper, decided to refill the mound and to put a time capsule in there. Uh, he dug down to the level that the dirt had been taken to before, again said he didn't find anything but a little bit of gravel. And then he backfilled the mound and restored it with his time capsule in there. Next slide. Next slide. And that's basically where it sat for a century. Hmm. In 1954, uh, Willis Dunbar, who was a professor of history and a city commissioner, thought it would be a good idea to excavate the site and see what it might have. So you see him with a first shovel full of dirt uh, in the upper left slide, upper left. And they dug down to the level that Mr. Sheldon had dug to before. They dug down a little farther and found a lens of gravel, uh, which they thought might have been a burial, but there was nothing but the gravel. Then they decided to take out Mr. Sheldon's time capsule and put in one of their own. Here you can see Dunbar in the pit. The gentleman looking straight at you is uh, Alexis Prouse. He was the director of what was then the Kalamazoo Museum. And the gentleman on the right is Nicholas Kick. He was the... Uh, chair of the library board, president of the library. So they put this large plexiglass tube wrapped in lead foil back in the mound and filled it up again. Next. We decided that what we needed to do was to take a look at what might have been in that entire southwestern quadrant, not just in the mound itself. And the tools we're using, again, archaeologists have been doing a lot of this borrowing stuff from the, from the army, from the government, from all kinds of scientific initiatives. What we were using is ground penetrating radar to take a radar pulse and shoot it down into the ground. It would be reflected by different densities and by different chemical compositions. There are other systems that would identify the moisture in the ground or the size of objects, but the radar pulse would be bounced back. And the gentleman pushing that machine would have the radar pulse bouncing back into a computer and that would be stored. They would go back and forth over the piece of ground in different directions. The radar would fan out below and the pulse would come back. And so as the computer got these images back in as mathematical numbers, it would begin to build a picture of what was below the ground at different levels and in different densities. Next picture. The ground in the area around Brownson Park is the result of many years of glacial outwash. If anybody's ever dug here, you know you go through sand and gravel and there are little pockets of dirt and sand and silt of different kinds. All of this makes it very difficult to read exactly what is going on. So being able to look with these ground penetrating radar images from different directions allows you to identify what are actual archaeological or cultural differences or mechanical differences, the result of human activity as the difference from the different lenses of sand and gravel uh, that are just laid down there by the glaciers hundreds and thousands of years ago. Next picture. Uh, this is Councilwoman Davis. Uh, before we did anything, we were working closely with the Machi Binashiwas Band. Uh, Council, Councilwoman Davis came to smudge the area uh, with, I believe, cedar smoke. 
so that the area would be purified for our non-intensive, non-destructive survey. Next. Next slide. Uh, this is Michelle Batten. Uh, well, she calls herself the dig chick, uh, running her machine across the mound. As you can imagine, the ground penetrating radar impulses coming from different directions as you go over the flat ground around the mound and over the surface of the mound need to be uh, adjusted for the angle of that machine with the computer doing that. Next slide. Next picture. Uh, oh, I, I would say that what we identified were we found the pit that the people had dug in 1954, and we got a really strong ping from that lead wrap plexiglass tube. Not much que question about that. We also identified a series of areas around the outside of the mound uh, where ground penetrating radar indicated there had been some degree of disturbance from probably laying down the sidewalks in that quadrant. We also identified a number of areas at the base of the mound that appeared to represent a structure or a series of large posts that had built, been built into a circle uh, before the mound had been constructed. So what we were able to identify is that the mound was not a burial mound. There were no burials in it. There were no areas of huge ceremonial offerings, but the mound itself had been built to commemorate some ceremonial activities that had taken place either in or around some sort of circular structure. Um, yeah. Jeff, I believe you're going to talk about what happened next, or shall I continue? Well, I think uh, with Dr. Bros mentioning here that uh, the questions that we were able to answer uh, is what what is under the mount? And, and how has the area around it been used? And right. as, as Dr. Bros mentioned, it, it did answer a number of questions that had been posed by the public uh, as to, you know, is this a, is this a burial area? And so the answer is no. Um, are there large areas of buried structures under here? And again, the answer was no. Uh, but it does appear that uh, it was, uh, there's evidence of it used for ceremonial purposes. And uh, also, Dr. Bros, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the age of the mound is uh, goes back to pr almost maybe a thousand years. There have been a number of sites like this excavated in other parts of southern Michigan. Uh, and uh, radiocarbon dating on the wood, they've been dug up, not just identified by radar, although some of them have had both techniques used. Uh, the wood that's dated generally falls in the period between around 7 or 800 AD and 1200 AD. This episode of warmer climate when agriculture is just coming in and a shift in ceremonial activity takes place. Burial mounds don't seem to be built after that in this part of the country. So you were correct. It is about a thousand years old. So with that, kind of the, the, um, the focus of the committee began to change. Yes. And to how do we how do we do appropriate education uh, regarding uh, the mound and its history and the people who used it, and part of that was to take a look at uh, four quadrants, and uh, we were going to have a, another representative from the tribal uh, organization here tonight, their historic preservation officer who uh, was not able to join us, um, Councilwoman Davis. Can I uh, call upon you to? The sure. four sacred medicines here, as we talked about the four quadrants related to the mound. Yeah, so uh, for the Anishinaabe in this area, um, those teachings are in relation to our four sacred medicines. And this diagram that you see up here um, conveys that um, same, uh, which is tobacco. And we have this, so I'm looking at a different um, eastern direction for that tobacco. and. Southern direction, um, my teaching is the cedar is in the south and the sage is in the western direction and the sweet grass is the northern direction. So these are life teachings um, that are passed down um, through storytelling, through example to our young people. They, um, for many people, uh, they learn these things through their life. Uh, during their life journey. Um, and many of them don't become reacquainted with them themselves until maybe they're adults or they're older. Um, but it's a, it's just a, an example of um, how unique our cultures are 
um, no matter who or where, but for Southwest Michigan, we're looking at the Anishinaabe here, Anishinaabek or Anishinaabek. Um, and, you know, that we had thrived and survived here, that we're resilient, that we're still here, um, and that this information uh, we want to share, we want to preserve. Uh, Lakota Pushedli, she's a tribal historic preservation officer, and she hired in with the tribe a couple years ago. Her role is to assist in advocacy and um, the reinterment of ancestral mains um, within our historical territory. And that for um, Machi Benashiwish or the Botawatomi is this Great Lakes area in the basin. Um, and so the tribe engages um, through formal and official tribal consultation um, to, um, along with other tribes uh, from this area to determine the best way to, if there are remains found or funerary objects, um, to have those reinterred back into Mother Earth. And so for our tribe looking at this place, um, it's an ancestral mound uh, and it probably, you know, it could be our ancestors, it could be all of the Anishinaabek, um, but, you know, our, our job is to preserve that, um, the remains that are there that are not human, but, you know, there were ceremonial practices um, that have occurred in this area. So we know that that place was highly honored and respected. So for our tribe, um, you know, we're looking at this as a way to preserve that, to teach the community about the history of Michigan and, um, you know, the indigenous people that have lived in this area for thousands of years uh, and to enrich everyone's life. It's a great teaching for young kids, um, for anyone who's, who is looking to learn uh, new and expand um, the information that they already have. So uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us to really take a good look at, you know, who we are as, as part of the human race. These teachings, um, they call it the circle of life. And so the, these, there are colors that are associated, the four races of man. And so we've got the red race, black, white, and yellow identified within this circular pattern as well. And so there's teachings that go with each of these, what you learn in that Eastern direction um, as a, a young newborn, what you'll learn in the Southern direction as a growing adult, what you're gonna learn in that Western direction when you've become older and you walk on. And that Northern direction is uh, where our, our elders are held up in highest regard, you know, as those bearers of culture, language, religion, um, and bring them teachings back down around. So there's some, really good things that we can do here and, and looking at how to help preserve the mound for everyone. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Davis. And, and on the whole topic of teaching, that became a, a focus for the, the committee. And so as we look at what happens next, um, the plan is to install four interpretive signs around the mound one at uh, each of the compass points. Um, Dr. Brose or Councilwoman Davis, do you wanna describe these a little bit better than perhaps I can? But again, they, it is exactly what the, the Councilwoman was talking about is, is teaching and educating. Phyllis, you wanna, Councilwoman Davis, you want I, to? Well, I think, um, you know, we've got these directional um, language inserted in here as well, but uh, the process and hopefully a plan to go forward is looking how we educate the community and finding ways to bring in, you know, that past. And it's an amazing thing to think of, you know, we live in a place that we can have um, direct line of sight with an ancient civilization, you know, and that's, that's a, a beautiful thing. Um, and looking at the growth of Southwest Michigan, of uh, the Kalamazoo region, um, 
how vibrant and diverse and exciting it is. And talking about, you know, some of the history of the Anishinaabe, um, you know, the uh, Potawatomi, the Three Fires Confederacy, you know, the strength and wisdom um, that the uh, Potawatomi, the Odawa, and the Ojibwe had as the three primary tribes in our area, um, you know, and their contributions to the establishment of, um, you know, pre-statehood, you know, the, the road systems, um, the rivers, those pathways of uh, travel and how they harvested, um, you know, so there, there's some real interesting things we can do there. And then just continuing on about the, the resilience when you look at that Northern direction of, of um, indigenous cultures and their place in time, you know, past, present and future and how we can convey that out to the community. So, you know, they are directional and they do carry a message with, with each of them and trying to help people learn a little bit of the language while they're at it. Well, thank you very much, Councilwoman. That, that uh, the purpose here is to, is, is to educate. And, and so what we wanna share again, finally, is as we've been working with uh, representatives from the committee and, and the tribal council of how do we preserve the history um, and, and honor the legacy of, of those who came before us here. And so we had the interpretive signs, which uh, Councilwoman Davis just mentioned. And then the final step would be uh, a new landscaping plan for the mound itself. Uh, this is, this is a, a diagram from looking from above down. Uh, this is the stage in the upper left-hand corner. And this dark green circle is the mound. Uh, and so the four plaques would be at the north south, east, and west, uh, parts of that panel. Um, and then the idea would be to have uh, a very different looking landscape plan for that mound. Um, and what has been developed in, in working with uh, the representatives from the Gun Lake tribe is a ring of what's called grandfather and grandmother stones that would ring the perimeter of the mound. Uh, and then a ring of native planting flowers uh, within those stones. And then on the mound itself would be uh, some uh, native plantings, more like ground cover uh, that would cover it. And so that, that is the plan that we as a group are working toward. And we're, we're pleased to present that to the city commission and the public tonight. Uh, the next steps going forward is to, uh, uh, we'll be doing some contracting this winter. And the goal would be to begin work on this in the spring of 2022. Uh, it's not a very complicated project, so we believe that, you know, come early next summer, this is what you'll see in Bronson Park. And so with that, I, I want to really thank uh, very much so Councilwoman Davis, uh, Councilmember uh, Jody Palmer uh, was not able to join us, but she's been on the committee. Uh, John Shaganabi also from the, he's been in different roles. Uh, but he's with the uh, Gun Lake Tribe. And Dr. Bros, uh, Lakota Posh Shedley as a historic preservation officer uh, from the tribe who's been working and she's helping us develop those signs and the uh, appropriate language and history that should go in there. And then the other members of the community that have been with us on this committee. So again, um, like leave closing words for Councilwoman Davis and then turn it back over to you, Mayor. Well, miigwech um, to all of you for taking the time to look at this, to review the summary. I think it was really an interesting um, opportunity for us to take a look back and to see what, um, you know, what happened years ago, thousands of years ago. That's kind of a mind-blowing thing for me. But I also just want to say miigwech to the work group and the committee. They've kind of evolved in over the years into other things from other things. And yet the goal has always remained the same. Um, it's to educate, to enrich the lives of the residents um, in, in and around the city of Kalamazoo and, um, you know, really engage the diverse community that it is. Um, so I'm really hoping that this is something that you will consider even more and, you know, have, uh, 
some questions or input about, you know, what you see for the interpretation and making, um, you know, preserving the mound as it is with minimal invasive type, um, you know, plants or just keeping it true to nature for what it is, is really a, a beautiful goal to have for, for those ancestors. You know, it's one of the best ways that we can learn to respect, you know, those people who have walked on and who were here, you know, thousands of years before we were. So um, I just want to say on behalf of my council, again, my chairman, Bob Peters, miigwech for, for taking the time. Well, Thank you. Uh, Mayor Anderson, that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy City Manager Chamberlain. And I know that you have been very, very involved in these discussions for, for quite a while now. And I really appreciate your consistency and your participation and <coughs> your, uh, uh, I would say, uh, recognition of the importance of this work that we do together and, and, and making that present in that space as we do this work. I also just wanted to say, uh, Councilwoman Davis, it's wonderful to see you again, even if it's on, on a screen. It seems like it's been forever since we've seen each other in person, but it is, it is great to see you here. For me, this is extremely meaningful, and it, it's wonderful to see that we are coming uh, to a place where in we can uh, do the best we can to take our thinking and the message and turn it to something uh, real and and recognizable and helpful right here in, in the in the heart of our community. So I really, really appreciate everyone's efforts on this. Uh, anyone on the commission who wants to uh, has any questions or anything about this process at this point? Commissioner Cunningham. I don't have any questions, uh, but can I make a few statements? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, one, uh, I'm honored. I'm honored that uh, city staff uh, continued this journey uh, to ensure um, the feelings and the sentiments that were presented in 2018 uh, move forward. Um, I, I give plenty of honor to uh, Councilwoman Davis uh, I also want to give honor to um, Commissioner Urban, because uh, I can remember in 2018 when we were going through, uh, you know, at that, that time, it was a very, uh, it was a very divisive subject. Um, and we had an opportunity to go and speak with uh, some of the leaders uh, from the Gun Lake um, tribe. And one of the pieces, um, and this is probably for my colleagues who will be moving on, um, that I really took away from that conversation was um, culturally, they make decisions from, for seven generations from now. And uh, that really was a cornerstone of a decision that I made then. Uh, and that's probably a piece of advice I still use to this day. Um, you know, I, I thought about uh, what was important for Bronson Park. And I can imagine, you know, my grandchildren, grand, great, 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 great grandchildren, uh, some of the conversations that we have today, I don't want them to have then. Um, but then, you know, I, I, what I'm finding unique about this particular project and the presentation of it is, you know, I, I love to travel the world. Um, I had opportunity, I, had a, I have a huge fascination with Ireland. And so I went to Ireland and I was walking in the, in the backwoods of Ireland, and you know, I was seeing some of these pieces of history that went back, you know, probably a thousand years. Um, my second home country is Tokyo, and you know, uh, they're they're very enriched in their culture, uh, and they and they hold on to some of those historical components, uh, and and again, thousands of years of history. Um, but when it comes to United States, you know, I, I, I've never had the opportunity to, you know, go back that far in our history because it's 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 pretty much maintained that it's only 400 years of you know education, um, and so now I can go to my children and say, hey, this piece this piece of um, 
work right here is 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 uh, it signals a thousand years, um, you know, of history within our community. So, uh, again, thank you to uh, all of the work that this team has continued to do. Uh, it's invaluable. Um, I can't put words to it, uh, but I am honored and I am truly appreciative. So thank you again. Um, and, and also to you, uh, Jeff Chamberlain, because I know, again, you've been instrumental in that conversation um, and you've given updates as the years have gone on. Um, and so to see kind of the fruition of the work of the team, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful and honored to, to be a part of it. Yeah, th thank you, Commissioner Cunningham. Any other questions or comments at this point? Uh, Commissioner Hess? Um, again, my like Commissioner Cunningham, my thanks to the team um, and to everyone for providing this bit of education for us tonight, because we all know it's, it's an important part of our community. Um, as we go to Bronson Park, like how many people have I just talked to in daily life and, and, and who have no idea what exists there? Um, and, and the consciousness that will be raised in this community by us actually having done this work and creating these um, these uh, uh, markers so that people can learn all ages from the young to the very young to the very old. And it just strikes me that the two presentations we had tonight, um, this one about um, seven generations. Thank you, Commissioner Cunningham for bringing that up. But the consumer's energy is also thinking centered seven generations ahead and uh, into a sustainability plan that will allow our all, all of our grandchildren to see their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren. This is really important work and uh, I appreciate your work on doing it. And um, um, to Jeff Chamberlain, thank you so much for uh, leading this committee and bringing this forward to us. It's important work. Commissioner Urban. You're muted, Commissioner Urban. There you go. I want to thank everybody for their persistence because this is this is a project that has been uh, moving along for, oh, I'd say 10 years or more. Uh, uh, even when I was on the County uh, Arts Commission, when I was still a county commissioner, there was a talk about how to uh, rebuild Bronson Park and what was going to be involved with that. The, the thing that strikes me as I listen to uh, Commissioner Hess and Commissioner Cunningham is the memorial that's going to be built uh, 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 at the site of the mound is not a, a, a sculpture. It's not something that, that looks like it's part of Western culture. It is the natural world uh, arranged in a form that is a natural arrangement. And so it kind of reminds me of where we all have come from and to what we look for our preservation. And it, it, it's, it's there that and we can't walk on it anymore. We can't walk over it like we used to. It, it has a presence now, a formal presence that reminds us that uh, the natural world is what we depend upon. So that's the message I take from this. I, I want to just thank everybody who's worked on this for so many years to get uh, to this point, and we're we're in the home stretch now. Thank you, Commissioner Urban. Anyone else? Uh, seeing no one at this point, I just want to thank you again for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, it means a lot, and. Uh, in, in my mind, this is just one step. This isn't the final step by any means. So this is one step. I know that there's more that we need to do and I'm looking forward to those ideas uh, continuing as, as we go on with this work together. So thank you so, so much. Now is the time our, yes, thank you, Councilwoman Davis and Dr. Bros. Now is the time on our agenda for commissioner comments. Are there any commissioner comments for the committee of the whole meeting tonight? Uh, seeing none, I just want to remind anyone who's uh, present with us this evening that our 
business meeting starts at seven o'clock tonight. And uh, it's not a long agenda, but there are some important agenda items and it will be available in the same fashion that this meeting is. So we look forward to uh, your participation in what will be, what about 50 minutes now? And we'll see you all in a little bit and we are adjourned.